Great. Hi, y'all. I am Katie Rose Sherwans. I'm the product owner for Family Tree DNA. We are the only company that offers mitochondrial DNA testing for genealogy. Mitochondrial DNA, or mtDNA, uh, that testing has long been discounted when it comes to genealogy research. It does take a little effort, but you can solve family mysteries and break brick walls through mtDNA, and we're about to make it even easier. Um, so I'm gonna start with a brief overview of what mtDNA is, how it's inherited, why mtDNA can help your genealogical research, and then we'll get into the meatier part, all the fun stuff. We're gonna examine my direct maternal line. Um, if you already know the basics, make sure you stick around because there's some really good stuff coming up, including a sneak peek at our new Mito tree and Mito Discover. So some housekeeping before we get started, um, please make sure your electronic devices are on silent, and while photos are allowed, please do not record, and please be sure to tag Family Tree DNA in photos if you post them to social media. All right, so we're gonna start with the sciency part. Um, mitochondrial DNA, or mtDNA, is found outside of the nucleus of the cell in the mitochondria, hence the name. MTDNA is really small, so there are only 16,569 locations or SNPs, and compare that to 22 million examined with Y chromosomal testing. Uh, there are three portions of the mitochondria. There's hypervariable region one, or HBR1, hypervariable region two, or HBR2, and then there's the coding region. Older family tree DNA tests, like the original mtDNA test or the mtDNA plus, only looked at just HBR1 or only HBR1 and HBR2. Other tests like 23andMe, Living DNA, and the Genographic Projects test, those are run on an autosomal microarray chip, and they only look at enough mtDNA SNPs to provide you with a broad haplogroup but they're not gonna provide you with mtDNA matches. You need a mitochondrial specific test to get those matches. Family Tree DNA's MT full sequence looks at all of the mitochondria, all 16,569 locations. We provide you with a full haplogroup and most importantly, genealogically relevant matches. One common misconception about mtDNA is that it's the same as xDNA from the X chromosome, but it's not. Um, so let's examine this a little bit. Everyone has mitochondrial DNA. It's inherited exclusively from mothers, so everyone has it, but only women pass it down to their children. It's passed down intact, so there's no random recombination or division between parents, unlike with autosomal DNA. The majority of mtDNA changes very slowly over time. Because of its inheritance pattern and the slow changes, mtDNA can be used for genetic genealogy purposes to trace your direct maternal line. So your mother, her mother, her mother, and so on. All the way back to mitochondrial DNA Eve about 150,000 years ago, the shared maternal ancestor of all humans. Everyone also has at least one X chromosome, which is full of X DNA. Women have two X chromosomes and men have one X chromosome. The X chromosome is found within the nucleus of the cell with the autosomes and the Y chromosome if you're male. X DNA can be passed down by both mothers and fathers. Mothers pass it down to all of their children, but fathers only pass it down to their daughters. Since mothers have two X chromosomes, that DNA randomly recombines when it's passed down to their children. So you can inherit parts of each X chromosome that your mother inherited from her parents. Uh, but since fathers only have one X chromosome, there's nothing for it to recombine with. So it gets passed down intact to their daughters. Because of random recombination, eventually the DNA gets diluted like the rest of the autosomal DNA. So you can only match up others you share a common ancestor with within a few generations. So how can a mitochondrial specific test like the MT full sequence help your genealogy research? Um, let's start with an overview of helpful results sections and then we'll take a look at how I'm using them to break my direct maternal line brick wall. The major benefit of the MT full sequence is that you receive matches you share a common ancestor with on your direct maternal line. 
Your mtDNA matches are determined based on how much of your mtDNA and another tester's mtDNA are the same. The more of your mtDNA that's the same, the more recently in time you shared a common ancestor. Um, you'll receive three levels of matches with the mtVil sequence. Uh, the coding region match level allows you to have up to a genetic distance of three with your matches, meaning that there's only three differences between your mtDNA and that other tester's mtDNA. These matches may share a common ancestor with you within a genealogical time frame. At the HVR1 and HVR2 levels, though, you'll need to be an exact match, meaning that there are no differences in your mtDNA and your match's mtDNA. Matching at only these levels can mean that your common ancestor may have lived before genealogical times. However, you shouldn't discount these matches fully. There may be some matches that have only done the discontinued lower level mtDNA tests, and that's why they don't match you at the coding region level that you get with the MT full sequence. While it may take some genealogical sleuthing to determine who your common ancestor with each match is, because mtDNA is only passed down from mother to child, it narrows all of your matches down to a single ancestral line, so you know which line to look for the common ancestor on. Most societies have been traditionally patriarchal rather than matriarchal, meaning that men were the leaders of the family, they were the ones who owned or could inherit land, they held apprenticeships and jobs, they went to war, many things that leave behind records. Some societies didn't even list the mother on birth records for their children. So it's easy to get stuck researching women in your family tree through traditional genealogy, and sometimes that happens pretty quickly. MTDNA matching, though, it doesn't require records. The DNA links you to others who share a common ancestor on your direct maternal line. These matches can provide clues to where your ancestors were from and who they were. Just because you're stuck, that doesn't mean that everyone else is stuck at the same generation, so your matches may have information that can help you out. Because the mother's surname is not typically passed down to her children, you probably won't recognize the names of your mtDNA matches. There are other ways that you'll need to find your connection. Many of your matches may have entered an earliest known direct maternal ancestor, and that's the mother as far back as they can go on their mother's 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 line. On your mtDNA matches list, there's an earliest known ancestor column that tells you the information that they've entered. You may be able to recognize names here. However, your matches may have been able to trace back farther than you have or less far than you have, so you'll also want to look at their family trees. To the right of your matches' names, there are up to three icons. There's an envelope for emailing your match, an icon that lets you take notes about your match, and if they have shared their family tree, a third icon will show that lets you view that tree. Because we know an mtDNA match is on your direct maternal line, it's best to start with the pedigree view version of the tree. At the bottom will be their direct maternal ancestors, and you may find a name or location here that fits what you know. You'll also receive a feature called the matches map. The matches map plots your matches earliest known ancestor locations on a map. This information is self-reported by your matches under the genealogy section in account settings. You're able to filter the list by the different match levels that you can view your closest matches or your most distant matches. You're able to find matches that share ancestor locations with you. For mtDNA, this is especially important because records can be so difficult to find and tracing one particular surname won't work. While you may not have your brick wall ancestor's birth surname, you probably know where she lived. You can use the matches maps to find matches whose ancestor also lived in that same location, which might be the connection that allows you to break your brick wall. You'll also want to examine the dates that your matches ancestors were in that location and continue to look for traditional genealogy records to prove the connection. Many families followed the same migration patterns, especially in the United States. So just because your brick wall ancestor migrated from, say, South Carolina to Kentucky in the early 1800s, and a match's ancestors also did the same, it doesn't mean that your common ancestor with that match is from that same time period. With mtDNA, it could be, or it could be a few hundred years before, and it's just a coincidence that both you and that match 
ended up following the same migration pattern around the same time. Another results section that can be helpful is ancestral origins. The information in this report also comes from the self-reported information under the genealogy section in account settings. While the matches map requires the location portion to be filled out in order for a match's earliest known ancestor to display on the map, this report depends only on the country of origin section. So some matches may have entered a country of origin, but not a specific location. And so they may show up here, but not on the matches map. This report is broken down by match level and genetic distance. It'll list the countries of origin provided by your matches, how many matches listed those countries, as well as any additional comments they may have made, such as an ethnic group or a more specific region within that country. Um, there are a couple of things to keep in mind with this report. So this information is all self-reported. Your match may have based their answer on a family legend and not on proven fact. For example, you may see matches that have said that their earliest known ancestor is Native American, but your MTDNA haplogroup is not one that migrated into the Americas during pre-Columbian times. And your, your common ancestor with your matches may be before or after their earliest known ancestor was in a specific country or part of a specific ethnic or cultural group. Um, in my ancestral origins, I have matches at the lower levels of mtDNA testing that list their ancestors as Ashkenazi Jewish. There is a subclade of my mtDNA haplogroup that is well represented with Ashkenazi testers. However, I am not part of that subclade, and those Ashkenazi matches do not match me at the MT full sequence level. So this means that my common ancestor with these testers is further back in time, potentially even before they were Jewish. And you'll also receive an mtDNA migration map that shows a reconstructed ancestral journey of your maternal line, starting from mitochondrial DNA Eve to your intermediate haplogroup. All humans today can trace our matrilineal ancestry back to a single maternal ancestor that's been nicknamed mitochondrial DNA Eve, and she lived in Africa over 150,000 years ago. Your mtDNA haplogroup is determined based on your mitochondrial DNA mutations or SNPs. Each mutation occurred at a specific location and point in time, which we know based on archaeological evidence and MT full sequence testing. You can also explore this ancestral journey more with the mtDNA journey video that you can create from your mtDNA results section. So this part of your results isn't likely to help break a brick wall, but it can tell you more about where your matrilineal ancestors were from long, long ago. I mentioned earlier that autosomal tests like the Genographic Project, Living DNA, and 23andMe only give you a partial haplogroup compared to the MT full sequence test. But why does that matter? So let's think of the haplogroup like an address. You'll have the root of the haplogroup, which is a letter like H, V, U, J, L, et cetera. Uh, this tells you what country the address is in. With an autosomal test or even one of the lower levels of, of mtDNA testing, that might be as specific as you get. And it's unlikely that the root alone will actually point to a country it's much more likely that it's gonna to point to a continent like Europe or Africa. Past the root, haplogroups are divided into branches notated by alternating numbers and letters. So with the MT full sequence test, your haplogroup won't just be a root like H, but instead it could be H2A1A1. And that's a mouthful, but it gives you so much more information about where your ancestors are from. So let's think about the address a little bit more. If H is the country, then two is the state. The first A is the county, the first one is the city, the next A is the street, and the last one is the house number. While your haplogroup migration path won't be as specific as a street or a house number, your full haplogroup can tell you the regions that your matrilineal ancestors migrated from and to, if they were Native American, Jewish, or part of another cultural group, and by comparing with the self-reported earliest known maternal ancestor locations of other testers and with the improvements coming to mtDNA reporting later this year, you can find out the country, county, or town your ancestors may be from, depending on how well tested your haplogroup is. All haplogroups are placed on a haplotree. 
For mtDNA, that's the mtDNA tree of humankind that traces all haplogroups back to the shared maternal ancestor mitochondrial DNA E. The current mtDNA haplotree was based on the phylo tree, which was an academically built mtDNA tree of humankind that was last updated in 2016. It was built with only a little over 24,000 mtDNA results, many of which were only partial results. And there's no plan to update the phylo tree again. Family Tree DNA launched the Million Mito Project in 2020 to rebuild and update the mtDNA haplotree, or the mtDNA tree of humankind, which we're calling the Mito tree. By analyzing more full sequences and applying the same processes that allowed Family Tree DNA to build the largest Y-DNA haplotree, the Y-DNA tree of humankind, we can also create the world's largest mtDNA tree of humankind. Uh, you can join the Million Mito Project by ordering the MT full sequence from Family Tree DNA. And if you've already done that, you've got your results, then you're already in. So most, if not all, of the haplogroups and branches from the phylo tree are very, very old. The time to most recent common ancestor for the branch is estimated at thousands of years ago. Just matching someone else with the same haplogroup as you is not helpful for determining when your genealogical common ancestor was or who they were. The Million Mito Project is building the new Mito tree with 20 times more data from full sequence testes, testers than the phylo tree used with both full and partial sequences. That data will create new branches, but most importantly, it's going to create younger branches. The more refined branching on the new Mito tree will be able to provide you with a better age estimate for when that common ancestor with your mtDNA matches lived, uh, with many of them estimated within a genealogical time frame. Like with YDNA, more MT full sequence testers will add more data to the Mito tree and allow for more branching and younger branching. Before the big Y700, many YDNA haplogroups were estimated to be several thousand years old. With tens of thousands of new big Y testers, we've added tens of thousands of new branches to the YDNA haplotree. And today, half of all testers have a YDNA haplogroup within a genealogical time frame, making it much easier to discover the common ancestor with your matches. The same is going to hold true from the Mito tree. More testers means more branches and younger haplogroups. More connections can be made and more brick walls can be broken. So we've recently developed our first draft of the Mito tree, including my section, and I'm super excited about this. So this is my phylo tree haplogroup, V7. Uh, it formed about 4,000 years before the present. It's old. It's not helpful for genealogical matching. There are only three branches below it, all of which are slightly less old, but still unhelpful, and none of which I belong to. And here's V7 after the Mito tree. There are so many more branches that it barely fits on this slide. I'm no longer at V7, but I'm on a new branch below it. So if you can see the tiny orange star near the bottom right with the arrow pointing at it, that's my new Mito tree placement. It's estimated to have formed around 1450. Not 1,450 years before present, 1450 AD. This means my new placement is just a little bit before my brick wall mtDNA ancestor was born, meaning that if I can find other matches that are on that same branch, I can break that brick wall. And to give you the, an idea of the size of the entire mito tree and whether you might be able to expect some big changes yourself, the phyla tree has about 5,400 branches. The mito tree currently has about 40,000. That's about 35,000 new branches, and most of those are younger branches. And over the past year and a half, YDNA testers have received a ton of new tools through the new Discover platform on Family Tree DNA, and those have helped them make those connections, break brick walls, and learn more about their paternal ancestry. We're working on a version of Discover for mtDNA, which is also coming out later this year, and we're going to bring these same tools and successes to mtDNA testers. 
So I'm going to give you all a preview of some of the new Mito Discover tools in the next few slides. Um, but please keep in mind that these are all still a work in progress. These are initial drafts of these tools. And so there's going to be many changes before they're available to everyone. So the first tool is the haplogroup story and the age estimates. Those are going to tell you more about your matrilineal ancestors and their journey across the globe, as well as how long ago your haplogroup is formed. Ancient connections will show you matches to archaeological remains. And I expect that there are going to be a ton of ancient connections available, as ancient mtDNA has proved to be easier to get results for than ancient yDNA. Notable connections will show you what famous modern and historical individuals you share a common ancestor with, and we've got lots of exciting connections ready and waiting. We'll add a time tree that lets you see when you share a common ancestor with your matches and which matches are more closely related to you. This time tree plus the younger branches is going to be a game changer for using mtDNA for genealogy. We'll also add an updated migration map that goes beyond the intermediate haplogroup level you have today and delivers a more specific location for where your ancestors are from, as well as allow you to explore your ancient connections locations. The country frequency map will show you where in the world today your haplogroup is found. And more of the YDNA Discover tools will also be available for Mito Discover, like the Ancestral Path, Globe Tracker, the Group Time Tree, and more. Um, our R&D team is always coming up with new ideas and new reports, so you can expect even more in the future as these tools keep evolving. So I find that examples are always helpful for figuring out what to do and what you can learn. So I want to talk a little bit about my mtDNA story. So some spoilers for the story. I've got a brick wall on my direct maternal line. It's my fourth great-grandmother. I haven't found the right records yet, but mtDNA testing might be able to help me find that mystery ancestor. I do want to preface my story with something. So I am a pale white American woman. I am looking for most likely a white European ancestor. It may not necessarily be easy, but it's probably going to be easier for me than it is if you're looking for an ancestor who is Amerindian, African, South or East Asian, or Pacific Islander. However, even if you're not looking for a European ancestor, you can apply the same methodology that I'm using to your own search. I can get my direct maternal line back to Sarah Adeline Moreau, my third great-grandmother. She was born in about 1818, presumably in Kentucky. These dates are from her tombstone, not a birth record or a baptism record. Her father is Moses Moreau. I found a marriage record for him, but that marriage happened in 1829, which is 11 years after Sarah's birth. That wife is not likely to be the mother. While it's possible that Moses Moreau is actually Sarah's stepfather and Sarah assumed his surname, I've triangulated some of my autosomal matches to this Moreau line, so I know he's the father. Moses Moreau was born in Abbeville, South Carolina, and later moved to Logan County, Kentucky, and then to McCracken County, Kentucky. Sarah's daughter, my second great-grandmother, was born in Kentucky, moved to Mineral Wells, Texas, where my great-grandmother was born, and then they moved to Osage County, Oklahoma, where my grandmother was born, and my mom and my sisters and I were all born in Dallas. I don't know who Sarah's mother was. I don't know who Sarah's older brother's mother was or if she had other siblings. That mother may not even be the same woman. Um, I've seen rumors suggesting that Sarah's older brother was born in Tennessee, which would suggest that Moses moved there before he moved to Logan County, which might give me another place to look for records, but I haven't found any sources for that rumor. I don't know where my maternal ancestors were from before they lived in Kentucky, although there are some family legends about it. Before embarking on your genetic genealogy journey, it's a good idea to have some goals in mind for what you want to find out from DNA testing. You could be looking for a mystery ancestor, trying to prove a connection between two or more individuals, trying to find out where your maternal ancestors 
ancestors were from or if they were Native American or Jewish. Um, you might have one goal or you might have many. Knowing what your goal is will help make sure that you get the right test for the right person. If your goal is to break a brick wall on your paternal grandmother's direct maternal line, getting an mtDNA test for yourself isn't going to do that. You'll need one for your father or a paternal aunt or uncle instead, someone who is the child of that paternal grandmother. So obviously, I want to break my brick wall. I want to find out who Sarah's mother was. I'd like to determine if Sarah and her older brother have the same mother, and I want to learn where my direct maternal line was from before they ended up in Kentucky. My autosomal DNA, my mom's autosomal DNA, and my maternal grandmother's autosomal DNA all have some Native American percentages that could be from my mystery ancestor because I haven't found anyone else that it is from. Um, but my grandmother also remembered that her mother said that that line was French or possibly Cajun or Creole from Louisiana. So, okay, I've got my goals in mind. How can I achieve them? How can I find the mystery mother? So I did the MT full sequence for myself. I also tested my mother and my grandmother. We're all exactly the same, so that's not a necessarily necessary strategy. Just one person from the line you're researching will work. I'm gonna go through all of my mtDNA matches to look at their shared family trees and their earliest known ancestors and locations to see if I can find a connection. I started with the MT full sequence level of matches, but there's a good amount of matches at the lower levels of testing that haven't upgraded. So they're gonna be good to look at too. I may be able to recruit some of those matches to upgrade to the full sequence level to see if they're a more recent match. And there are also a number of distant cousins that are matrilineally descended from my great grandmother and my second great grandmother that I could recruit to test. Maybe they'll have some more information about my mystery ancestor, but if not, their test results may help refine my portion of the mito tree and help me get improved age estimates for when I share a common ancestor with other full sequence matches. Sarah's brother would have received his mother's mtDNA but he wouldn't have passed it down to his children. His children would have received their mother's mtDNA. So this one's gonna be trickier to prove and it's not something I can prove through mtDNA. Um, it's several generations back, so autosomal DNA might not be helpful either, um, but I'm gonna try that too, just in case. Um, but since it can't be done with mtDNA, we're gonna ignore it for now. I'm also joining any relevant group projects that I can find and collaborating there with the administrators and other project members. And I'm reaching out to group project administrators for other almost relevant projects like the Moreau Surname Project. Um, the Moreau Surname Project only accepts YDNA Moreau testers. So even though I can't join and even though I'm not looking for a Moreau surname match, those administrators may be able to help me find the mother or mothers of Moses Moreau's children. It's a good location to find other people who are interested in the Moreau genealogy. I'm also continuing to search for records. So for example, I can try to figure out when Moses left Abbeville, South Carolina. I know his parents moved to Logan County in 1810 and Moses was giving land in Logan County the same year that Sarah was born. But did he move prior to that? Did he get married in Abbeville or in Kentucky? Who moved with him? Who lived near him? My mystery ancestor might be around um, amongst those people. And I'm also con connecting with any relevant genealogical societies or community groups that I can find. Um, there's a Facebook group for both Kentucky and South Carolina genealogy, as well as local societies for Logan County and Abbeville. All right, so let's look at my mtDNA matches. As expected, except for my mom and my grandmother, I don't recognize any of my matches' names. Unfortunately, I don't recognize any of the early Sony ancestor names either. Um, my next steps are going to be to look at the family trees of the matches that have provided them and see if I can match other names in their direct maternal lines or locations in their direct maternal lines. I'm using the note icon to take notes about each match that I investigate. So unfortunately, while my closest match technically has a shared family tree, the names of, on it are placeholder names. So it's like mom, dad. Uh, they're not names of ancestors, so that tree's not helpful at all. 
Um, but I can reach out to that match to see if they sh can share some better information with me. One of my matches has a recent direct maternal ancestor from Osage County, Oklahoma, where my grandmother was born. And one of my matches has direct maternal ancestors who migrated from Virginia to North Carolina to Kentucky all about the same time as Moses Moreau. So my next steps here are going to be to dig deeper into the direct maternal lines of those two matches. You know, find sisters, maternal aunts, and so on. Look for names that might show up connected to Moses Moreau in the records. These could be things that can help me break my brick wall, or they could be coincidences since it was fairly common to migrate from the former colonies on the east coast of the US to Kentucky to Oklahoma. Right now, which test level you match at is the best way to determine which matches are the closest to you. And after the MinoTree release, you'll be able to utilize discover tools like the time tree to determine which of your MT full sequence matches are closer. But if you've done both an MT full sequence and a family finder, which I recommend, you may be able to narrow it down a bit more through the advanced matches tool. The advanced matches tool lets you search your match list to find testers who match you across multiple types of tests. So you can search for people who match you on both the family finder test and the MT full sequence. This may mean that your common direct maternal ancestor is in a pretty recent generation. However, because the family finder looks at all of your ancestral lines, it could also mean that you you're match that person on two separate lines more closely on a line that isn't your direct maternal line, and then more distantly on your direct maternal line. So remember to examine match trees, use tools like family matching, the chromosome browser, and the matrix, and the in common with filters with the family finder to confirm that the match that shows up in advanced matches matches you on only your direct maternal line. Um, when you're using advanced matches, you'll want to select Family Finder and then one of the mtDNA match levels at a time. Make sure to select Yes next to Show Only People I Match in All Selected Levels. While my search at the MT Full Sequence level, which is described as FMS here on this page, and my search at HVR2 only re returned just my mother and my grandmother, when I searched with HVR1 and Family Finder, I got a list of more names. The first name on the list and the last name on the last two names on the list are a different subclade of haplogroup V than I am. So those are highly likely to be matches distantly on my direct maternal line and more closely on a different ancestral line because they have a more specific haplogroup, which means they have tested at the full sequence level and they don't match me there. The other people on this list have only taken the older mtDNA tests and they haven't upgraded to the MT full sequence yet. So I went to my family finder results to examine these six matches. I confirmed that three of them share an ancestor with me on more than one line. Two of them don't have shared family trees, so I couldn't prove anything there. And one of them has a tree, but all of her ancestors are in Australia. These three matches, I'm going to reach out to you and ask them to upgrade. And then for the ones who don't have trees, I'll ask them for more info there as well. And then I'm also going to check the matches map to see the earliest known ancestor locations for my MT full sequence matches. There may be matches who haven't shared a tree but do have a shared location. And then you can reach out to them and ask them for more information like a tree. Um, when you click on the pins on the map, it'll tell you your match's name, their earliest known ancestor's name, and the specific location. Um, my matches that have provided that information have also provided trees, and I didn't find a connection on those. However, it's possible that a direct maternal relative of these matches migrated to the United States East Coast and was also an ancestor of my direct maternal line. Um, so I'm going to want to look at the family view for their direct maternal line on their trees and potentially build their trees out more to see if I can find that connection. What's going to be really, really helpful here is the Mito Discover time tree when it's available. So once the Mito tree is released, I'll be able to find out which matches are on my new branch, the one that was formed in 1450, meaning these people are going to be my closest mtDNA matches. These are going to be the ones that I want to focus on to break this brick wall. So this is the time tree for my new mito tree placement. 
There are around 20 of us on my branch, which is estimated to be formed in 1450. Um, one of those is me, and two of them are my mom and my grandmother, but the other 17 are matches that I need to look at to break my brick wall. Um, we're working on adding your matches' names and earliest known ancestor names to the time tree for YDNA right now, and so that's going to be something that we add here for Mito Discover as well. My other goal is going to be to find out where my maternal ancestors were from before they lived in Kentucky. Um, there are two potential guesses when I started. So they could be French, Cajun, or Creole, or they may have been Native American. Uh, well, my maternal haplogroup is a European haplogroup that is not found in pre-Columbian populations in the Americas. So my direct maternal line is definitely not Native American. Um, to attempt to figure out a more specific location than Europe, I'm going to look at the matches map and the ancestral origins pages and some of the new Mito Discover reports. I'll want to start with my matches that are the closest to me, so those full sequence matches, but it can be helpful to look at the more distant ones at HBR1 or HBR1 and 2. Um, remember, some of those matches may have an older mtDNA test that they haven't upgraded to the full sequence. Once we've released the Mito tree and Mito Discover, I'll be able to figure out which of those matches are my closest ones out of all of the full sequence matches. Then I can look at match family trees again, and I may be able to determine where they were from. Group projects and genealogical societies and communities are helpful here too, uh, especially once I start narrowing it down to a country. Um, so there are groups and communities that can help with French ancestors, Northern Irish, Irish ancestors, and so on. Um, since I know Sarah's father was born in Abbeville, South Carolina, I did a little research about the loca that location. Um, so it was mostly settled by French Huguenots and the Scots-Irish. If Sarah's mother also comes from there, she might be from one of those two populations. So let's look at the matches map again. Out of my matches that have provided an earliest known ancestor location, I've got Northern Ireland, Ireland, and Scotland. At the lower levels of matching, the earliest known ancestor locations are all over the United States, they're all over Canada and Europe. Um, while there are lots of Huguenot ancestors on that list, it's highly possible that my common ancestor with those matches is before genealogical times. And it's not obvious enough to narrow it down. Looking at my ancestral origins report, there are a whole lot of countries some of my matches have provided, and some of them have added extra comments as well, like if their ancestors were Ashkenazi or Sephardic Jewish or Sami from Scandinavia. But my closest matches all have origins in England, Scotland, Ireland, and Northern Ireland. The time tree will also show those who have entered an earliest known ancestor country of origin, but maybe not a location. Looking at me and my 19 closest matches on the time tree, it's very similar to what I've discovered in ancestral origins. Scotland, England, Northern Ireland, and a handful of us who can't jump the pond yet and some who just don't know what country their matrilineal ancestors are from. And the country frequency map shows the same thing. It leads, leaves off those who don't know what country their matrilineal ancestors are from, but there's a lot of strong evidence here that we've got a British Isles origin for my maternal line. While my haplogroup is definitely European and not Native American, I may be able to narrow down where in Europe it might be from by finding some ancient DNA studies. Um, once Mito Discover is launched, this will be as easy as just clicking the Discover link on my dashboard and navigating to the Ancient Connections feature. But until then, we're going to have to do some good old-fashioned Googling. Um, and then I'm also going to check out the group project for Haplogroup V, since there is one. I discovered that there are ancient DNA studies that have been found um, with Haplogroup V in Neolithic England, as well as Bronze Age sites in Germany and in the Mykov culture. And the Haplogroup is most frequently found today amongst the Sami in Scandinavia, um, in the Basque in Spain, and in Eastern Europe. It's definitely something that I'm gonna keep in mind that V7 was found in Neolithic England, and my closest mtDNA matches have earliest known ancestor locations in the British Isles. It's not a confirmation yet that my ancestors are from there and not from France, but it's definitely a strong possibility. 
And while we haven't added all of the mtDNA ancient DNA connections yet, I've already got more in MitoDiscover than I found with my Google search. So I've got connections in Russia, Germany, Poland, Hungary, Romania, Croatia, and England. Um, there's a good amount of ancient DNA studies that have been done in the British Isles. Once we add in all of the mtDNA from those, I'm going to look at this again because I'm getting more and more confident that that's the area I need to be looking in to find where my ancestors are from. I also checked the mtDNA public haplotree to view the country report for haplogroup V7. So not everyone with haplogroup V7 is going to be a match to me, but this might give me a guide to where my ancestors may be from. Um, the most common country is the United States, so those are going to be other people like me who can't jump across the pond. Um, then we've got Scotland, England, Germany, Ireland, Northern Ireland, Ukraine, Russia, Greece, and Saudi Arabia. There's no France, and if you add up everyone with England, Scotland, Ireland, and Northern Ireland origins, then the British Isles is the most populated here. Um, this could be another sign that my maternal ancestors aren't French, or it might be biased because DNA testing isn't available in France and Family Tree DNA has a large amount of testers of British Isles origins. Um, it's still not enough to disprove the family story, but combined with my matches earliest known ancestor locations, I should definitely be looking at places besides France for my mystery ancestors. So my story isn't complete yet. I haven't met my goals, I haven't broken my brick wall or found where my ancestors are from. I did get a new match on Thursday and I got really excited that I was gonna have to change everything up here, but that match didn't have a tree. So that's another person I'm gonna email. However, I've made some progress and I have a plan moving forward. No genealogy tool, including DNA testing, is like waving a magic wand to get all of the answers. With any type of DNA testing, you may be waiting for the right person, that magic person, to test and match you. You may even need to go out and recruit them yourself. If you're researching a direct maternal line in your tree that isn't your own, you'll need to determine the right family member to test. It might be as simple as testing your dad for his direct maternal line, or if it's further up in your family tree, you may need to build the tree out through daughters to find a cousin to test. So if you want your paternal grandfather's direct maternal line, look at his mother. Find any daughters she had and daughters that she had and so on until you find someone who can test. If she didn't have daughters, look at her mother to find what daughter she had and what daughter she had and what daughter she had until you find someone to test. Another good recruitment strategy is to look for haplogroup matches in the autosomal databases of companies that provide an mtDNA haplogroup with that test. So 23andMe, LivingDNA, and soon, Family Tree DNA's Family Finder. If you have a haplogroup match with one of those tests, or a match who shares the same root as you, since this will be a partial haplogroup, reach out to them and see if they'll get the MT false sequence from Family Tree DNA and keep trying different tools. DNA testing is just one of the tools that we all have in our genealogical toolbox. If you can't hang a picture frame with a hammer and nails, then get those sticky Velcro picture hanger strips and try that. Um, or as my maternal grandmother would say, there's more than one way to skin a cat. And once I do answer my questions, I'm probably gonna come up with more questions. Um, at that time, it's going to be time to set new goals. Um, there's always another ancestor to find. So maybe my next goal will be to do mtDNA testing on a different maternal line in my family tree, like my dad's mother's direct maternal line. And of course, the most important tip is going to be patience. Um, you may not have that magic match when you first get your results, the one that breaks your brick wall and has all of the ancestors going back many, many generations into the past. You might not figure it all out immediately with the release of the Mito tree in Mito Discover. You may have to use multiple tools, be proactive, and wait for the results to pay off. But with the MTFL sequence test, you'll be prepared for when that magic map match shows up. Even if the answers aren't there immediately, you've got your fishing pole in the pond and you're ready and waiting for that bite to give you the answers you need. 
One thing I love about the genealogy community is that there are a lot of knowledgeable, enthusiastic people who want to help others. Family Tree DNA has a number of resources available for beginners, experts, and everyone in between. Um, there's information in our help center, we're on all the big social media sites, there's great information in our blog, um, our customer support team is highly trained and can help answer questions as well. And one of the best resources at Family Tree DNA is our group projects. They're run by volunteer administrators and they help people work towards a common genealogical goal. Um, whether that goal is confirming a lineage, helping adoptees find genetic relatives, or learning more about a specific haplogroup or surname. And then there's the larger community beyond Family Tree DNA. Um, Diane Southard's Your DNA Guide has mtDNA resources. Roberta Estes's DNA Explained blog has a ton of mtDNA resources. Um, there's the Mito YDNA site to help you potentially connect with matches who tested elsewhere, and local genealogical societies, and many conferences like this one that you could attend or view on-demand content from. So remember to give feedback in the app. Uh, there are some instructions here. Um, when you go to the Roots Tech mobile app, find the session and scroll down to fill out the survey and let me know how I did. <laughs> if you'd like to get in touch, um, you can reach out to Family Tree DNA Customer Support. Uh, we have a great blog that you can subscribe to. We're on all the main social media sites, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, threads, and you can find both Family Tree DNA, Family Tree DNA and me on LinkedIn. Um, also, make sure to stop by our Family Tree DNA booth, whether virtual or in person, for more information, to chat with us, to pick up discounts on all of our tests and upgrades, including the MT full sequence, or just to say hi. And thank you all so much. Um, I am more than happy to answer questions. Um, just make sure if you do have a question, you come up to one of the two microphones here. That way, everyone watching this on the live stream will be able to, to hear the questions. Hi, I'm Karen Lowe, and my address is U5A1A2B. <laughs> Hi, Karen. <laughs> Hi. I'm wondering um, a couple things. One is uh, how the earliest maternal ancestor, you know, when I enter my earliest paternal um, ancestor, his name is Lau, my name is Lowe. Uh, in Tennessee, it's said Lao, so that's very consistent. Mm -hmm. How are you thinking of, of evolving the earliest maternal ancestor entry? You know, I'm thinking of like, well, at this time in the 1850s, my maternal surname would have been uh, Heishman, and then 1830s, it was Sap, and 1810s, it was Cloud. Mm -hmm. You know, how, how will you represent that? That is an excellent question, because, you know, why DNA? you probably have the same surname going back. It's the paternal line, it's your father's line, his father, his father. mtDNA, it's women going back, so we changed our names with marriage. It's gonna be different every generation, which is why you don't recognize the names of your matches unless you actually know them in person. Um, so we've had a few suggestions come through, like you know, instead of just entering one ancestor, you can list all of your ancestors out. Um, so, like, I would say, okay, this is my mom, and these are her years, and where she's from, this is my grandmother, her years, where she's from, her mother, her mother, as far back as I can go. Um, with mtDNA, that can definitely be more helpful, because you could see, like, okay, I don't recognize this name, I don't recognize this name, I don't, I do recognize that one, and then it keeps going. So, if we just went with that ancestor that's as far back as they can, you, you still, you wouldn't recognize that name, but you would recognize one in the middle. So we're looking at a lot of things like that, and if you've got suggestions on how to best do that or any other ideas, um, reach out to our customer support team and they can forward it over to, to me on the product team and we'll take a look. 
So I've done a full mtDNA test, and I have an extra mutation that my aunt and my sister and my daughters do not have. And that mutation ends in an R. Could you explain a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, so with mtDNA, there are mutations that are called heteroplasmase, which is a really long scientific word that no one recognizes. So what it means is you have a change happening in your mtDNA that is in progress in you. So for that SNP, that location in your mtDNA, some of those SNPs have you know, an A, a T, a C, or a G, and some have a different letter there. So if it was an A over here, some of them have a T. If it was a G, some of them have a C. And when that happens, if you have that in 20% or more of your mtDNA for that location, it's called a heteroplasmy. With mtDNA matching, you have to be an exact match at the lower levels, and you can only have a genetic distance of three at the, the full sequence level. And heteroplasmy is depending on how the change is happening, can count as either one mutation difference or two. So it could be, you know, your, your sister, your mom, and you're a genetic distance of two from them. And you're like, what is this? How did that happen? Um, when we bring the mito tree into the light of day, um, we're also going to make changes to MT full sequence matching. Um, we've long wanted to take heteroplasmy into account and do that matching differently. And since we're going to have new haplogroups and you'll potentially have a different haplogroup than your other close matches, then we're going to have to change up mtDNA matching. Um, so we, we've got a plan for this, and we're going to make that matching a lot easier and help you figure it out. So with, does, does that mean that a change is going to happen eventually? Like, should my granddaughters check and see if something's up? by then, or what do you so, think is going to happen? Um, if you had it yourself, but your daughters don't have it, then that means it was changing in you, and then it the Just change, it, it went back to whatever it was going to be okay. by the time it got to them. So cool. your granddaughters probably won't have it. Okay, thanks. Yes. I was listening to you and the presentation, and I was listening to some other presentations, on DNA, and the database that they had came from mommies in Egypt that was dug up that began all this. You're talking about the original Eve and this 100-something thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. Where did they find the mommy or the DNA for Mother Eve on this program? So we don't have the actual DNA of mtDNA Eve. And Eve was very likely more than just one woman. It's you know, a set of women that, women that we can all trace our ancestry back to. Through ancient DNA testing, like those mummies and other ancient sites that come up, and through testing of people like us here in this room, our phylogenetic experts are able to say, okay, this mutation came first, this one came next, this one came next, because when you test enough people, you can, you can see who was earlier and who was later when those changes happened. We can also pinpoint those to a specific location where they happened as well. So if everyone that has this mutation is in Africa, and then there's another mutation and everyone has it is, you know, a few miles down the road in Africa, and, and so on and so on, that also helps us build that out. And for more information about that, come on over to our booth because we've got our um, phylogenetic experts, including the scientists that's building the mito tree there, who can explain this all much more better than I can. I think you did a good job. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I could take seconds all day long. Yes. Um, <laughs> a couple questions. Um, one is, is there a sweet spot? You know, in autosomal, we talk about second cousins a lot. Um, I have a mitochondrial. I don't have super close um, matches. I am lucky that uh, a second cousin got at least the 
U5A or, or so from 23andMe, so that's great because our grandmothers are sisters mm -hmm. uh, on the maternal side, so it's confirming. Um, I'm also really lucky that uh, my mom's father is apparently H1C, which is great because everyone <laughs> that I know who has that yeah. um, is French Canadian, and I believe his maternal line is French Canadian, so that's yep. Yep. amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, a uh, great confirmation, it wasn't a brick wall, but, uh, so is, my first question is, is there a sweet spot of the, num like my daughter's in the room, I don't see the need to do a full sequence on her, it might be interesting if I had a mutation, but, but mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, if my eggs were present before I was born, you know, she, she probably uh, is identical. Right. And my second question is, obviously, we should all build out robust trees on family tree DNA so that folks can take advantage of that. But when we're hunting for testers, or, or like the, the uh, women from Quebec, I can't see their uh, trees because they're not in my matches. Do you have a favorite other place that folks are working together, you know, to find okay, of this, of this maternal ancestor, um, these are all of the MT descendants of this person, these are the X descendants, these are the autosomal descendants, uh, so you can help find those cousins who you would like to test. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so for the first question, uh, which was, you know, what's the sweet spot for finding other testers, other people to test and help improve your results? You know, you're right, you know, your daughters, your, your mother, they're, your sisters they're, and brothers, they're probably all going to have the exact same mtDNA as you. That's not a necessary strategy. It's fun, it's cool. If, if they really want the results, go for it. Um, we don't know a lot about what that sweet spot is right now because the, the mito tree, the, the phyla tree is so small. There's been so little research done on mtDNA matching so far, even though it's been around since family tree DNA started in 2000. Um, with the mito tree, we're going to be able to find that sweet spot. With the improvements coming with mito discover, we'll be able to find that. And I suspect it's probably going to be very similar to the big Y, where rather than testing your father or your brother or your uncle, you want to go out and find a, a third to fourth cousin, a fifth cousin to, to test that's on that same direct line. And then for the second question about you know, where to find trees, where to find people to, to recruit and test, um, look in other autosomal databases where they give you a haplogroup with that autosomal test. Find someone that's potentially on the same line as you. Um, so I'm V7, if I find other V7s, that's awesome. I can get them to take an MT full sequence. If they're V, awesome, I'll get them to take an MT full sequence. Um, also, like I mean, I'm in every database I could possibly be at. I'm at Ancestry, 23andMe, Living DNA, My Heritage. My Heritage is great for their trees. There's Family Search of their trees. WikiTree is fantastic as well. Anywhere that's got genealogical rec records and people working together is a great place to look. <laughs> I was so excited that you said WikiTree because I know you have Mags Golden in the Family Tree DNA booth, but I'm also doing a talk at 4.30 from the WikiTree booth with nice. DNA expert Peter Roberts. Nice. Um, and nice. so we'll be talking about that particular global tree and why we like it for tracking DNA descendants. Absolutely, yeah. Aside from being a group project administrator with Family Tree DNA, Bags is also my cousin, so I'm excited to have her there with us. <laughs> Hi, so I, I think I you five A's have a lot of questions about what's going on. So I know you started in, in Greece, and uh, you, I'm U five A two B four. Pretty unusual. I know the Samis, about 50% of the Samis have it, and mm -hmm. Cheddar Man was like the only person to have it. And on, I've been looking on the um, internet, and there are some people in Norway, there are some people in France. Mm -hmm. uh, my family comes from a Lombard settlement in um, Italy. Okay. And so I was wondering, um, where is the migration of this particular group, because it seems to be a very sparse, very, it's not very robust like H, you know, everybody's mm -hmm. H and, yeah. <laughs> and uh, um, any comments? Sure. Um, I don't know that particular answer myself, but 
come on over to our booth in the expo hall and Dr. Paul Meyer will be able to at least look it up for you and help answer that question. <laughs>